Ghost Hunting in New England, your favorite spooky podcast. Hello and happy Wednesday. Welcome to this week's episode of Ghost Hunting in New England with your hosts, Amelia. And Beth. And hi, Beth. Hi, hey, Amelia. You're kind of in charge of this episode today because you've been wanting to do it for a while. So. so yeah, this week we are doing something super spooky. We are really in the final countdown to Halloween. And so I have been wanting to do a whole series on abandoned mental institutions across New England because we have a lot of them. I've been kind of sort of playing with this in my mind for, oh, I don't know, a year, a year and a half. And so we're just going to give you the rundown on the history and some of the scary stories that happen at haunted, abandoned mental institutions here in New England. Ooh. 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 We're going to cut that out. <laughs> no, we're not. All right. Do you want to start or do you want me to start? I think you should start because I have a pretty good one to totally wrap up with. Okay, great. Okay. Yes. A lot of history in this one, Beth. So I know you're going to love it. All right. Well, I am just going to turn my mic off and sit back and let you talk then. So the first, well, my first story has a lot of history and my second story is kind of short, but I put this thing out on my Facebook, which is, I was like, yo, did anyone ever break into a hospital and see a ghost? And I got a really good story out of that. So that'll be my second one. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. So we're really going to build this week. This is like a build week, you know? Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Story numero uno. New Hampshire State Hospital, a.k.a. the New Hampshire Asylum for the Insane. That was really cool how you moved in close to your microphone because it gave it a really like spooky, deep vibe. Like that. The New Hampshire State Hospital was originally constructed in 1842 in Concord, New Hampshire, and was the 17th such mental institution in the country to cater to the state's mentally ill population. The first patient was 35-year-old married farmer from Tufanboro, New Hampshire. He was admitted in the grips of a religious excitement that had taken reason from his mind and pleasure from his life. He was treated with the moral treatment program described. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Can you back up and say that again? It took reason from his mind and pleasure from his life. Reason from his mind and pleasure from his life. His religious excitement. What kind of excitement removes pleasure? Anyway, he was treated with the moral treatment program and released after two and a half months as improved. He was never readmitted and presumed, quote, cured. Wait a second. Was this one of those forced conversion issues? Like, No, I would say, if anything, it was the opposite. And what's religious excitement? I'm not, well, but I'm, I'm thinking, like, was this one of those things that people used to, to send gay people to in order to try to, like, not gay them anymore? Uh, possibly. We will go over something kind of related later. Uh, okay, yeah, that just, that whole thing just struck me as like, oh, this is one of those, n those people that just don't understand that, like, biology is biology, so. Well, it says religious excitement, which makes me think, so, like, like, uh, you know, my friend Mike, he had this friend and her mom, they lived out in Western Mass and they were like very religious. And so like her mom used to speak in tongues. So maybe this guy was speaking in tongues. All right. Originally, the hospital consisted of a main administration building with two symmetrical wings, the female ward to the left and the male ward to the right. In 1892, Dr. Charles Branford had the Brancroft <laughs> Dr. Charles Brancroft, should I say, had the Brancroft building constructed as a residential dormitory for female patients. The Twitchell House was built two years later in 1894 for the same reason, but for male patients. In 1899, the nurses' annex was built to accommodate the facility's growing number of staff members. Before 1899, the nurses lived on patient wards during their shift intervals. How weird is that? I mean, it's super convenient, but yeah, I think that I like to leave my job at the end of the day. I don't think that I want to live with the people that I work with all day long. Especially if they're mental patients. I don't think that you've met my family. I go home to my mental patients. Oh my goodness. 
Okay. <laughs> so, oh man, where was I? Oh, this new nurse's home was connected to the Brackroft building and the main administration building via a tunnel S hallway that allowed for easy travel. So that's like those underground tunnels that we see a lot in hospitals and colleges. And uh, you can look online. There are videos of people who like travel down there and they're like, ooh, it's spooky. But there aren't, I don't know, no one ever sees any like ghosts. It's just spooky. Okay. So in 1907, a new medical surgical building named the Thayer Building was constructed adjacent to the main administration building. It provided the space for routine surgeries as well as sterilizations, which were commonplace during New Hampshire's eugenics movement, which is where all that stuff kind of comes together. And it's really sad and a really terrible, terrible. Your hospital sounds awful. Awful. Really awful. And actually, I didn't realize this, but did you know eugenics wasn't even coined until 1883? You'll be surprised to know that I did know that. I Well, you're a teacher, so they don't teach you that in photography school. But that, I mean, that's awful. I, I, it makes me very upset. Okay. But to go on at that terrible part, the asylum was not a state institution, although the state granted money for the construction and the original building. Patients were charged $2.25 per week. Patients who were indignant were admitted with an agreement that their expenses would be paid by the town selectmen or country commissioners for their home communities. It's not indignant. It's indigent. You're right. Patients who were indigent were admitted with an agreement that their expenses would be paid for by the town selectmen or county commissioners of their home communities. You know, it's funny you should bring that up because this whole time I was like indignant. I'm like, I'd be indignant if I had to go to a freaking insane asylum, but at least I'd get my trip paid for. All right. Anyway, back to the story. The charges dropped to $2 per week for several years. Patients who are not residents of New Hampshire, aka from Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, and occasionally further away, were charged 25 cents per week more. The hospital was a working farm and grew much of its own food and dairy products without the need for financial help from the state throughout its first 70 years. The farm on which patients were welcome to labor to the extent they chose was an important part of their conjugal healthy outdoor activities that characterized the program of care. The farm activities prospered and continued into the 1960s. So here's like kind of a weird thing, which was very common, very common for uh, state hospitals at the time. In 1917, the hospital had 1,000 patients. The population continued to rise every year until 1955 when they had over 2,700 patients. How many was it designed to support? Not that many. Because I remember when we went up to the um, the hospital with Jamie. Why am I blanking? Denver, Denver State. Oh, the Danvers State Hospital. Yeah. That she said that it was designed for like 500 people, but they had like 2,000 people living in there. So, yeah, I think it was a situation like that. So, um, the crowding was extreme to the point where like government officials were like bringing it up in like state hearings. Like, you've got to do something about that hospital. It's not okay. So, uh, for some years in the 1940s and 1950s, each psychiatrist had an average of more than 250 patients to treat. While kindness was always the philosophy, providing individual care of any type had become impossible. And for the most part, society had come to view the mentally ill, not as people who needed humane treatment, but had co-signed the mentally ill to dark and humiliating corner of American life. State hospitals became the physical reflection of that attitude. Books like The Shame of the States and Asylum or movies like The Snake Pit drew attention to the play of the mentally ill. The annual reports made clear that despite the best efforts of the staff and administration, the New Hampshire State Hospital had become quite a different place than the asylum of the 19th century. In New Hampshire, as well as nationally, the problem of mental illness had become a simmering pot waiting to boil. A dramatic, unforeseen, and incredible change began to take place in the 1950s. Within 30 years, the patient population of the state hospital would change from 2,700 to less than 500. And by the closure, the population was less than 300. 
medications, especially Thorazine and its relatives, were introduced. They were remarkably effective in reducing, in many patients, the worst symptoms of severe mental illness. By the 1960s, these medications were in wide use, allowing patients the possibility of living outside the hospital. Wide use and widespread overuse and abuse. Yes. In 1963, President Kennedy proposed, and Congress promptly passed, the Community Mental Health Centers Act, a bold new approach to mental illness that provided a broad array of services in the community. In 1968, federal legislation to Medicare allowed the disabled mentally ill to have an income. This made possible the ability for those with pervasive mental illness to afford to live outside of the hospital. In 1971, lawsuit of Wyatt versus Stickney was an additional force. These events paved the way for one of the great social transformations of American history, deinstitutionalization. The facility closed its doors in 1989, and all services were moved to a new state-of-the-art hospital named the New Hampshire Hospital. The former building became state offices with a large number of organizations operating out of the former hospital campus. The Bancroft building, however, remains abandoned, as well as the Kent Annex and the Peace Leave Annex wings of the main administration building. People who work in the state offices often hear voices and particularly hear a lot of screaming. Paintings and clocks are seen falling off walls as well as things falling off the desk where no one's around them. And people also talk about hearing furniture moving, but like they'll hear it moving in the next room and they'll go in the next room and everything's fine. There's nothing's been moved or touched. And so that is a little about New Hampshire State Hospital. It didn't have any specific ghost stories, but it did have a lot of history about state hospitals at the time. It's so funny that you had all of the state hospital and the mental health history because my first story that I wanted to talk about um, was built as a TB hospital for tuberculosis patients. My second one is a TB hospital. I liked how you worked in all of the information. All right. So I'm going to do a weird thing here. I'm actually going to share my screen with you so that you can see this, but mainly it's so I can see you on the side while I'm going so that if you're reacting to stuff, I can see you. Make sense? I don't have to read along, do I? No, not at all. So the Undercliff Sanatorium is my first haunted abandoned hospital this week. And we're going to travel to the distant New England land of Connecticut and the town of Meriden to find this former sanitarium. This is a fun fact. Sanitarium has two different spellings. Sanatorium with two A's and one I is primarily found in British English. And sanatorium with one A and two I's is a North American English term. So here in the U.S. and in Canada, people tend to use sanatorium. (laughs) Uh, But anyway, they both come from Latin words that mean to heal. They mean the exact same thing and they're interchangeable. But back to my story. The Meriden Sanatorium was built in 1910 as a place for tuberculosis patients to go to recover from their illness. TB was the primary driving force behind all hospitals that were built in the, 19, in the 1800s and early 1900s. TB is a bacterial lung infection, and it causes chronic cough. And as your cough worsens, patients get blood in their mucus. Uh, if it's untreated, TB can destroy tissue, including lung tissue, and it can actually wear away a hole in your lung. So I think that's how people with TB die, that then they're just not able to breathe at all. Um, Another fun fact, not included in my script here, but um, the reason that people have handkerchiefs with uh, embroidered things on them, like little cherries or uh, strawberries, like any little pictures on a handkerchief, is actually from when people used to have tuberculosis like all over the place, and they would take out their handkerchief and they would cough into it and the the patterns on their handkerchief would hide the blood stains that came up so um, i just i thought that was really gross and interesting when i first learned about that now we treat tuberculosis with strong antibiotics over a long course it's like six to nine months Uh, but before antibiotics people would just go 
to these hospitals. There, there was no real treatment for it other than to just give them peace, quiet, sunshine, ocean air. You know, that sort of stuff was, was thought to be the best thing to happen. Um, antibiotics weren't discovered until the late 1920s, and they weren't really widely used until World War II. So that's why we had so many TB hospitals. Uh, after World War II, when the antibiotics were really more widespread, uh, we started to see a lot of consolidation of the TB wards in different hospitals, and they would all move off to a hospital together. So the Meridian Sanatorium, right? That's what we're talking about. Uh, it was still built in 1910. <laughs> In 1918, it was actually the first hospital in the United States, and mind you, there were only 48 states in the United States at that point. Uh, it was the only hospital to serve patients with uh, TB infections, to serve children as patients with TB infections. Uh, in the early 1920s, it was renamed to be the Undercliff Sanatorium, uh, and obviously there's a big cliff there, uh, and that's how it got its name. Question, question, question. Is it under the cliff? I'll get to that a little bit later. I don't okay. think so. But you'll okay. see why. Uh, Were people jumping off the cliff? Sorry. I'm sorry. It remained a pediatric hospital until the 1940s when it started taking adult patients. Um, there was the widespread use of the antibiotics by the 1950s, and all of those wards were being consolidated. Uh, and in 1954, all the TB patients at Undercliff were sent to the Seaside Sanatorium. Uh, so 1956, the Connecticut Department of Mental Health took control of the buildings and grounds and renamed the facility Undercliff Hospital. They accepted mental health patients until they closed the facility in 1976, and the building and grounds fell into disrepair over the next 40 years while it just sat there. Nobody did anything with this property for the next 40 years. Uh, as was very sadly common in the early 20th century at mental health facilities, there were abusive and inhumane practices committed against the patients regularly. Electroconvulsive therapy, lobotomies, hot or cold water immersion, and isolation rooms were regular practices at the hospital. The hot and cold water th immersion, that I think, I, I mean, they all sound absolutely horrible, but that one for some reason really like struck a chord with me that I was like, I think that would be probably the most upsetting of all of them. You think so? I, yeah. I, I, have a, I have a drowning thing. Oh. So when I think about it, it's like, is, is the person so out of their mind that they like don't know what's happening? Because that would be horrific to all of a sudden be like in an ice bath. But at the same time, I can think of like a dozen people I know personally who regularly take ice baths and like cold showers and they, they do it for their mental health. Interesting. Yeah. It's like a med it's their meditation thing. Mm. I don't do it. I don't want to do it, but no, I do know you. people who do that. But then again, they're making that decision. Like they are a, right. I mean, how sound mind? I don't know. Would it be considered sound mind at this point in history? Probably not. But by, you know, we let them walk around today. And uh, that's what they do. Yeah. Well, I mean, it comes down to all behavior is a, a form of communication. And so you might be like, well, they're, they're just acting irrationally and they're, you know, like they have all these behaviors. We're going to dunk them in a big bucket of ice water. Like, well, <laughs> their behavior. I, I tell you, Beth, I would take ice water over lobotomy any day. See, the thing about a lobotomy, though, is once you have it, you don't know you have it. Yeah, but back then they didn't always put people down for them. No, oh, okay. Uh, one of the more disturbing, unsubstantiated stories I came across was about a patient who lived in the hospital during the 1950s or 60s. He was reportedly murdered by the other hospital patients, and the whole event was then covered up. Supposedly the man was murdered with a set of plastic utensils from the dining hall. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, I, it, a plastic utensil in a mental health facility to me is a spork. Was this man murdered by sporks? I hope not. Like that. that sorry, that just it was very upsetting. Uh, like, people report that, that the ghost of this patient roams the grounds at night, moaning in agony from his slow and torturous death. Do you think they scooped his eyeballs out? Wow, I had not considered that. That's a way to die slow. I'm pretty sure somebody could scoop your eyeballs out with a spork and you would live. Oh, you could, but not if you were like crazy and unattended and then you like bled out or got an infection. Okay. They said it was slow. Yeah. 
But I, I was thinking it was slow because, you know, plastic knives don't make a really deep cut, but they could make a lot of them. Yeah. You know, or like little, like, I mean, I'm thinking spork, but maybe they were regular, like, four-tined plastic spork, plastic forks, but I don't know. Um, again, there there are no actual reports of this incident happening, uh, It's but who knows, right? It was It was a mental institution in the, you know, 50s and 60s, and heaven knows what went on there. One of the things that I found really interesting in our kind of like research of the the mental health facilities and the hauntings there is a lot of times you do think of a mental health facility as being haunted, but good luck finding those stories of like the actual ghosts that people have seen or, you know, any of that stuff. And I know Amelia and I talked about it during the week that, you know, we, we were struggling with finding like real firsthand stories from different places. So that was part of our our research this week, but um, I did find reports of other stories. So I'm going to share those with you. There were a lot of reports of people breaking into the buildings during the 1980s, 90s, and early 2000s. Um, But again, I couldn't find any firsthand stories. Uh, There are stories of people walking by the abandoned buildings and hearing the sounds of children laughing and crying. People report looking up at the windows of the buildings and seeing the spirits and shadows of children appear and then disappear from the windows. When they're inside the building, people tell stories of hearing running footsteps. Uh, Some speculate the footsteps are of patients running away from the orderlies, and other people think they might be the footsteps of doctors and nurses who are running towards emergencies happening in the hospital. Um, And so I I thought that was actually a, a really nice interpretation of why there might be urgent footsteps going down the hall like that. Oh, 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 and of course, we can't forget the blood-curdling screams from nowhere. You know, and then all the the usual stuff, the cold spots, the doors that close, you know, things that happen in pretty much any haunted location. Um, Some of the electronic ghost hunters who have gone in there recorded EVPs, and people tell of seeing manifestations of spirits that just appear in the hallways in front of them, next to them, and then just fade away, just disappear. Uh, One of the more famous patients to have lived at Undercliff Hospital, and if Amelia happens to be looking at my text right now, I for some reason wrote the Undercliff Hotel. It was not a hotel. It was a hospital. Uh, Was the serial killer Hayden Clark. Now, he's a cross-dressing cannibalistic serial killer. And nobody knows exactly how many victims he had. It's anywhere between the two that he was actually convicted of and maybe two dozen that he's at some point talked to other people about. Um, And I first heard about him, it was so interesting, on Forensic Files, because I'm a huge Forensic Files fan. One of his victims was this woman in her early 20s, and her name was Laura Hodlinger. And it always stuck with me because it was just such a crazy story. And this is why I brought up that he was a cross-dressing serial killer. I obviously, I wouldn't care about that otherwise. But after he murdered her, he dressed in her clothes and put on a wig with the same blonde hair. I've heard of this story. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This is very famous. Right. And so he wore her clothes and the wig and everybody thought it was her and they couldn't figure out like people saw her leave the house that morning. They like what happened to this woman? And they eventually caught on that something had gone wrong because he had brushed his wig with her hairbrush and then left her hairbrush on the dresser and they found a single wig hair in that hairbrush. And that's where they started to get the idea that like maybe possibly there was like someone else here who wore a wig and pretended to be her leaving. So any, it was right. Like it's just, it's a crazy story. Um, But anyway, in April of 2000, uh, he's imprisoned in Maryland, I think. Uh, But he was brought by the Maryland State Police up to Connecticut, and the Connecticut State Police brought him out to the Undercliff Hospital grounds, where he was supposed to show them the location of one of his victims. Apparently, they didn't find anything there where he was saying that this victim was, um, but it was just crazy, like how appropriate that this serial killer, who likes to eat pieces of his victims, um, buried one of his victims on a creepy abandoned hospital grounds. Like just, it it was just nuts. And I couldn't believe when I saw his name as being associated with this hospital. So to kind of turn from the really creepy serial killer to a little bit lighter note, 
I think this was in 2010, there were three amateur ghost hunters trespassing on the property. Uh, They were spotted by the police and they made a run for it. One of the young men jumped off a cliff in order to escape and broke his leg in the course of his fall. When asked why they were there in the first place, they told the police they were there to check for ghosts. Better to fall and break your leg than fall and break your neck or your skull. Yeah. Maybe better to stay off of properties that are, you know, marked as no trespassing and the police will come and chase you off a cliff. What's that movie I like that's really messed up and they have the people falling? Midsommar. Never seen it. Well, look at this. We finally have a movie I have seen and Beth has not. Well, in all, in all fairness, I've seen a lot of the mainstream movies and you see a lot of the weirdo B-list horror movies. This was a very great film. Okay. I'm not even going to call it a movie. I'm going to call it a film. It was Is not B. I, well, yes, it was very nice. My brother took me to the movies and we saw Midsommar. And uh, yeah, there is a part where they follow like, well, I, I won't give it away, but it has to do with people falling off cliffs. Okay. And, and hopefully not. On rocks. Hopefully. Ugh. No, that and sounds they show awful. the whole thing. Okay. So. All right. Um, Good story, Beth. Wait, we're not done. Oh. We're not done. Um, so the main hospital building itself was demolished in 2013. Uh, There are still several outbuildings on the property. The property is owned by the state of Connecticut, and it is very clearly marked with a whole bunch of no trespassing signs. Uh, It's guarded by security, who will very nicely escort you from the property into a waiting police car if you find your way past them and onto the grounds. So I would not recommend that anyone go out and try to do their own uh, ghost hunting at Undercliff Hospital. Unless you really want to prove there's a ghost. And in which case you need to talk to someone and get permission. Please don't, please don't go trespassing on private property. Even though the state owns it, which I think makes it public property. I mean, if you're going to go, just social distance. Okay, <laughs> so my next story is right around here, Beth. This is right down the street from us. Really? Yes. Tonight I am talking about the Plymouth County Hospital in Hanson, Massachusetts. Really? Very I did not close know there was a Plymouth County Hospital in Hanson, Massachusetts. There is. It is. Part of, is it part of the old Taunton State Hospital? Which, incidentally, is within the Bridgewater Triangle. I believe Hanson's in the Bridgewater Triangle, isn't it? Maybe. Eh, we can double check. Um, I had heard we about just this. just redraw the triangle if we need to. That's true. Because yeah. I do know a lot of people who have broken into this place. But I didn't know the girl whose story I have had broken into it. I knew people from like when I was in high school. Okay. In 1919, the Hanson Tuberculosis Hospital was constructed as a sanatorium to treat victims of TB from Boston and Plymouth County. When the tuberculosis epidemic died out due to advances in medicine, the hospital was used as a general hospital under the name Plymouth County Hospital. The role of the facility changed once again in 1982 when it began providing special long-term care to patients with chronic and terminal illnesses, such as muscular dystrophy. The 68-bed chronic care facility was thus renamed Cranberry Specialty Hospital. Because if you're from around here, you know this is where all the cranberries come from. I love cranberries. I love cranberry everything. I do too. I make this really bomb like cranberry pumpkin muffins. So good. I'll make you some. In 1990, are there going to be eggs in it? No. In 1991, I make all my money off of cooking. I don't know why you people give me crap. Okay. In 1991, all 60 patients were transferred to a new building 18 miles away in Middleborough. And the old hospital was shuttered in 1992. The 56 acre property was sold from Plymouth County to the town of Hanson for $950,000 in 1999. Wowie. In 2001, 23 acres were sold to Barron Partners, who planned to build townhouses and an assisted living facility, but the plans fell through. The property has been... Too many ghosts on the property? We'll find out. The property has been subject to great amounts of vandalism and arson as lengthy court battles proceeded. After several stages of demolition, the hospital was completely razed in 2017. 
In 2014, four teenagers were arrested there for trespassing, and it made the local news. And I actually remember that happening because I was like, why is this in the news? Anyway, uh, producers from the television show Ghost Hunters have reached out to Hanson officials seeking use of the hospital for an episode. But according to Lieutenant Yakovonis of the Hanson police, he says that they were denied because the complex is too dangerous. Passerbys have described hearing screaming and laughter coming from the empty building or simply a feeling that something inside was watching them. Ooh. Well, knowing now that a bunch of people you knew in high school were breaking into the building and partying in there, um, perhaps the screaming and laughing that they heard was actually your friends. Probably, yeah. Okay, and now, so this is from Bridget. And Bridget and I went to college together, but she's actually from the same area. She, well, I guess I won't say where she grew up, but she grew up in the South Shore. And we met in college, and we still talk all the time. Okay, so this is what Bridget sent me as a request to my Facebook post about if anyone's seen a ghost. Okay, so when we, this is what she says. So now here's from Bridget. So when we were like 16 and a half, we broke into the old tuberculosis hospital in Hanson, and we not only saw a ghost, we saw two. Wow. One was sitting in a wheelchair, and the other was pushing it. That's amazing. It was I'm literally- so impressed that she was able to see a wheelchair. I mean, this is insane. Okay. It was literally the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. First, we saw the wheelchair moving, and then it kind of came under the light of the moon. And clear as day, I, taught, I saw two very sickly-looking ghosts, and we all screamed and ran so fast. That was it. And then we got back into my friend's truck, and we all said we saw the same thing, and it was crazy, and I barely talked to any of them anymore, but I'm sure they would all remember that, too. That's outrageous. I, Unbelievable. That's amazing. Thank you, Bridget. Thank, thank you so much, Bridget. Great story. Sometimes, just occasionally, I wonder, in a situation like this, like, maybe it was just some guy and his wife. Maybe it wasn't a ghost. Maybe like, it was just a guy in a wheelchair and his wife was pushing him or, you know what I mean? Like, on an abandoned 53-acre tuberculosis hospital in the middle of the night? Oh, it was the middle of the night? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, why would there, why would there be somebody there for a, an evening walk in the middle yeah, of the night? Yeah, remember they saw, they saw the wheelchair and then it kind of went under the light of the moon and that's when they saw the ghosts. And they all saw it. I think that's wild. She said, yeah. you know, I was like, this is gold. Thank you, Bridget. I right. Like you a and drink if you were one of those other you. people with Bridget, by all means, right into our show and right on in. tell us what you remember seeing because everybody sees something a little bit different. But spooky. Barry. That was amazing. I love it. Isn't that crazy? That's all I got. Next story. Let's take a trip to beautiful Waterford, Connecticut. We're going to park in the parking lot, walk past the gate, down the path, and under the covered bridge. In front of us is 32 acres of pristine beachfront property overlooking Long Island Sound. There's ivy climbing the stately brick walls. There's playground equipment sitting in the front yard. The building was designed by Cass Gilbert, and it's the Seaside Sanatorium. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Cass Gilbert designed a few other places you may have heard of. Are you waving at me? I have a question. Okay. Is this the same seaside one that people in your last story were sent to? Oh, you, you caught that, did you? I did, yeah. I was yeah. listening. Same I was place. being an active listener. Excellent. So Cass Gilbert designed a few other places you may have heard of. The Woolworth Building in New York City and the U.S. Supreme Court Building in Washington, D.C. Oh, Amelia's... I think she might be taking her phone out to look for a photo of the Supreme Court building. No. No. The Woolworth building didn't burn down, did it? Uh, I don't know. No, not at all. I do know this building, and it was not at all what I was thinking of. Okay, you can continue. I apologize. That's okay. Uh, while the jury is out on the status of ghosts at those two buildings, we've got some stories from the Seaside Sanatorium to give you the chills. 
Built in 1934, the hospital was home to children with tuberculosis. It served other functions over the years, a geriatric facility for a few years in the late 1950s, a mental health facility in the early 1960s, and finally a home for the intellectually impaired from the late 1960s until it was closed in 1996. Starting in the 1970s, there were charges of abuse and neglect of the residents, and the Seaside Sanatorium was reported to have a higher death rate than similar facilities throughout the region and the country. When they closed in 1996, there were many unanswered questions about the residents and what became of them. How did they die? Where were their remains put? No one knows. So it's understandable that there may be more than a few unsettled spirits hanging around. I was lucky enough to find five firsthand accounts of ghost stories from the Seaside Sanatorium. Okay. So these first two are going to come from trytoscare.me. And this first one is from Veronica. I grew up right down the street from Seaside. My brother and I used to go into ghost hunt at night. We were able to get in through a broken window and walked all the levels, pure chill bumps. You just feel this nervous feeling. One time we went in and we found a helmet slash headpiece in one of the rooms, and my brother thought it would be a cool idea to take it and bring it back home to my parents' house. Shortly after, we began experiencing paranormal activity. We're hearing voices and whispers and began having an overwhelming sense of unease. One night, a toy in the closet turned on and started playing music without being touched. The next night, my brother was cleaning out his Jeep and his Jeep door swung and slammed closed. He ran inside and screamed that we needed to return the helmet. I never truly knew if paranormal activity was real until going into Seaside and then these occurrences. Ghosts are very real, and Seaside is definitely haunted. Ooh. Yeah, that I I think that we all, if we learned nothing else from the Brady Bunch, it was leave the haunted idols alone. I learned don't throw a football at your sister. I also learned that applesauce goes with pork chops. I learned that from my mom. I was too young for Brady Bunch. We didn't have cable in our house, so we were stuck with 457 25 38 56. And the Brady Bunch was a summertime staple. But yeah, so um, if you're in a haunted place, don't take anything with you. Remember, sometimes the spirits are attached to those items, and you don't want to bring anything like that home. All right, the next one is from Holly... And this is also on try to scare dot me. I went here with my friend Lauren. We walked the property. As we walked, I felt a feeling of sadness. We walked through a small covered bridge type building, and as we walked through it, I felt an uneasy feeling like someone was walking with us. I wish we would have been able to go inside the building, and I do believe it to be haunted. As my friend Lauren and I walked the property, I looked up at the building, and in one of the windows, I saw someone standing there. There was not anyone around while we were walking. Right? Like faces that just appear in windows, right? Creepy. Yeah, that's pretty spooky. Also, like the covered bridge stuff. Now, whenever I think of covered bridges, I just think about getting abducted by an alien. Really? Yeah, that's where Tom Reed had his thing. I know, but when I think of covered bridges, I think of that story that uh, Mike sent us where he and his daughter went out to the covered bridge and they were waiting for some relative's ghost. Yeah, I used to think of Beetlejuice, but now I think of aliens. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, all right. So these next three stories are from uh, damnedconnecticut.com. I have been on that website before. It's very good. Yes, and I spent a lot of time on there today because I got two stories from Connecticut. Yeah, they do a really good job. So this is from Nan. My friend saw a pair of eyes staring us down from the end of a hallway filled with cubicles. We both heard what sounded like a high-pitched voice, almost singing-like, not threatening. Other than that, there weren't any vibes. And in fact, when we went around midnight, and I walked around with little anxiety. However, both his camera and my cell phone died inside the hospital. My cell phone had been acting funny from the time we stepped foot on the grounds, and had been at full battery before going inside. Coincidence? Maybe there are no coincidences when it comes to being spooky. Yeah. The idea of like this pair of eyes just like staring down the hall, like <laughs> makes me think of uh Will from Long Island Paranormal and his his red demon eyes that he was telling us about. Yeah, Will Fox has a lot of 
scare, uh, staring stories. Oh, apparently, yeah, he, I mean, he has a lot of ghost stories in general. Yeah, he, he brings out the staring eyeballs, apparently. He does. Everybody wants to see him. All right. This next one is from Emily. My boyfriend went with his friend after we heard a noise four times on the fourth floor that sounded like a homeless person to us. Sounded like people talking back and forth. Well, they went, and it turns out there's nothing but pigeons up there. Huge ones, he says. Well, he went through the whole building twice and found no evidence of people living there, but I know I heard voices at the stairs on four separate occasions with different people. Creepy stuff. Also, on the first floor by that room that looks like some sort of dentist's office, we heard people talking in the hallway and breathing right behind us, but there was nobody there. Between the dentist's office, the huge pigeons, and the disembodied voices? Ah! The pigeon impression. Listeners, you should know that usually in every episode that I edit, I cut out at some point Amelia making pigeon noises. And today they get to stay in the episode. I know. We finally had an episode that really had a pigeon in it. <laughs> this, is, this is the last story that, that I have on this, and then I just have a little bit of wrap-up after it. Uh, this is from Bob of Connecticut Ghost Seekers. The Connecticut Ghost Seekers sent an advanced team out there to see if there was anything worth investigating. Very nice, peaceful place on the water, and we met the security guard and had a nice conversation with him and found out a lot of history of the place. We took a lot of pictures and ran a voice recorder while we were there. Because of security on site, we were not able to go inside, but as we walked along the back side of the first building, we heard a dog barking inside. We told the security guard, but he walked the inside of the building and could not find a dog. Also, after examining the voice recorder at home, we found some EVPs from that same area. A male voice that wasn't happy we were there. And guess what else, Beth? What? There was no security officer. (gasps) That would be pretty silly. (laughs) That would have been a great twist at the end of that one. All right. So those are all, you know, some pretty hair raising stories. Um, I was also able to find reports of two different ghost hunting groups who went in. Oh. In 2007, New England Paranormal Research Group was granted permission to go into the building where they recorded EVPs and caught many orbs in photographs. In 2011, Damned Connecticut investigated and wasn't able to find anything. Disappointing. But not every ghost hunt results in a find. So if you're thinking that you want to be a ghost hunter, remember, you're probably going to have to go on lots of ghost hunts before you actually find a ghost. Uh, The Seaside Sanatorium's grounds are open to the public, but the building is closed. Recent photos show that it is fenced off with a big, ugly chain link fence. Uh, There are security personnel patrolling the grounds to make sure no one gets in the building. But the pictures show that it's a really lovely place. And when I have a day off, like a full day off, I think I may just take a drive down there and see it. It just looks beautiful. And the the building itself is, I mean, other than like the sort of dilapidated state that it's in, the, the pictures of the building that were taken very recently, it, it looks like it's still in very good condition. Uh, it's, you know, I, I think that it would just be a nice place to go and sit and eat a sandwich and look at the water. That's great. So no new stories, no new reviews. No new emails, we no Facebook that. messages, no Instagram messages, no shirtless pictures. Uh, no we, we, did get, pictures. We, did, we did get a shirtless picture. Stop it, we did. Yeah, it was a joke. Who sent you another shirtless picture? So, they put it on our Facebook wall. Is it another one of those, like, somebody just, like, hung up an outfit and took the shirt off of it? Or? It has been said that topless photos are needed here. Well, here's mine. No shirt, no filter, no skin, no organs, just my energy. And it's this. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. It's just a hotel room with like a black energy, dark energy yeah. uh, in it that Mike who, sent to us. Who sent that to us? Uh, Mike, Kosha Leviathan. Oh, ah, okay. So... Awesome. He gets uh, shout outs two weeks in a row. Way to go. Yay. All right. Do we have anything else? I bought two pumpkins today. My boyfriend says they're really ugly. And I asked him to bring one up from the car when he came home from work. And he called me from his phone 
uh, and was like, so did you mean a, an actual pumpkin or this gross blue thing in your car? And I was like, the gross blue thing, please. Because right now, Whole Foods is having a sale where you can get two blue pumpkins for $10. Are blue pumpkins actually pumpkins or are they just gourds? Probably gourd. Okay. I mean, well, they look like a pumpkin. <gasps> is it a blue Hubbard squash? I don't know. I sent you a picture of it earlier today. I know, but all of a sudden, I'm like, if it's a Blue Hubbard squash, can you make it into a pie? Cause, I'm on keto. Because, well, I'm not. And my mom, who makes the Blue Hubbard squash pies, is in Canada. I'll make you a pie. Okay. Thank you. Can I make you a mini pie? Of course. But you're going to have a lot of Blue Hubbard squash if that's what you're going to make it. I'm going to send you a photo of it right now, and you can tell me if that's what it is. I'd, well, I don't know. I'll have to send it to mom and ask her. Have you seen that Donut King, they are really upping their donut game? Yeah. So I thought uh, I might swing by there tomorrow. Check it out. That sounds good. Yeah. I will not have any because I am on keto and I'm losing a ton of weight. I know between your Peloton and your keto and your intermittent fasting and all I, of your- I know. I hate how hip I am. I have become so hip and I hate it. Well, you're hip and you're going to be thin and I am way lame and pretty fat. And no. You know what? First of all, you look great. And second of all, I told you to get the Peloton membership too. Come over to my place sometime. We'll do a stretch class together. I'm not going to buy a Peloton. What am I, made of money? No, you, you just get – no, it's – so, okay, so you can buy the bike, which I did not purchase the bike. My roommate very lovingly purchased us one. When you say roommate, do you mean <laughs> do you mean that Liddy bought you a Peloton? Liddy went and worked really hard and saved up all of her pennies and bought me an exercise bike. But you can get the Peloton classes for like 40 bucks a month. And since you're not really supposed to go to the gym right now, that's, you know, it's a good deal. I wake up every morning. I wake up at 5.30. I do a yoga class. I take a Russian lesson. And sometimes I'll do a spin class. My friend and Sabrina down in uh, D.C. She has one, too. We spin them together at night a few nights a week. I'm tired just thinking about that. I'm going to go home and make spaghetti with sausages for dinner, I think. Yum. Yeah. All right. Is that all we got tonight, Beth? That's it. All right. So, as always, you can find us online at ghosthuntingintoengland.com. Would not suggest that's the first place you go. I have not touched it in almost a year. Uh, you could find us on Instagram, much better place to go at ghosting in new England, facebook.com backslash ghost hunting in new England on Twitter at ghost hunting N E. Oh yeah. Send us your drive by ghostings, AKA ghost stories from our listeners. You can send those to ghost hunting in new England at gmail.com or leave your carrier pigeons at home because we are socially distanced on zoom recording at our houses now. Uh, let's see. Five stars. Five stars. Five yes. stars. Yes. Send us some five-star reviews. And we did get one this week. Thank you, whoever left it to us. But you didn't write any comments. So I have nothing to read. So please okay. leave something you to read. You know how much we love to thank everybody by name or handle, whatever. Just <laughs> knowing that you like me. Us. Us. Like us. Like us. Us. No, I know. But you have better self-confidence. I, need- I know, but... I, I know. Ma- the- mainly the people like Amelia. It's okay. No, that is not true. Stop it. They like her because she's spooky and thin and tall, and I am just her short, fat. Amelia girl. is not thin. <laughs> it's not thin at all. That's why she's working out every day. <laughs> she, someone had a few too many cookies in quarantine. So um, I yeah. ate half a package of Girl Scout cookies right before we started this. Mm, yummy. What flavor? Uh, the thanks a lot ones. So the shortbread with the chocolate on the bottom. Those are the worst ones. What? No, the peanut. Anything with peanut butter is the worst ones. Are you crazy? You don't like the peanut butter patties? Those are my favorite. I think they're that vegan. The thin mints are by far the best ones, and you have to put them in the freezer and eat them when they're frozen. Yeah, that's all right. I still like the peanut butter patties. No, I, I really don't like peanut butter or anything. I have four different kinds of peanut butter in my fridge right now. I like fluffy nutters. All so, right, remember, that's all we got. Like, what? subscribe, review, rate, email. Email. And remember, and if you're on Instagram, Amelia is like stalking all over Instagram. She wants more Twitter followers. Yeah. So like us on Twitter. You can add her as a Facebook friend. She adds everybody. And um, if you're in a restaurant, 
don't tell the owner that they're pronouncing the name of their business wrong. Keep it to your Yeah, you know what else you shouldn't do that? If you're a vendor and that owner is buying stuff from your business, don't be like, uh, you know you say the name of your business wrong. Uh, thank you. It's mine. Bye. And as always, happy hunting. <laughs>